Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Louisa Morse. I am the division chair of STR and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event on how strategy research can engage with the state. This year, STR running several events on impact and relevance. So please keep an eye on the STR homepage or our social media for advertisements of the next events. I'm sure that we're gonna have a very interesting conversation today. And thank you very much to the esteemed panelists for being here and participating. And also a very big thank you to Richard Whittington for organizing the sessions and moderating the panel today. I'm gonna to hand over now to Richard to introduce the, today's event and also to introduce our speakers. Hello everybody, wonderful to see you all. Uh, we're really delighted to run this session because strategy in the state is possibly a subject we wouldn't have considered two decades ago. I think nearly every day, uh, in, in the contemporary world, we are reminded about the importance of the state, whether it's the European Union intervening and in trying to regulate artificial intelligence, for instance, whether it's the Chinese state um, with its uh, large state-owned enterprises, or indeed even the United States um, imposing sanctions regimes and similar. So the state is everywhere, highly important topic at this moment, and we're really delighted to have a panel of five experts who will be speaking on this in the coming uh, one hour and a quarter or just less than that. Uh, we'll be stuck. I'm delighted, by the way, to say that we also have three continents represented here. And that's important. It would have been lovely to have had five continents, but such as the concentration of research, I think, in North America, this is a fairly natural distribution. We'll be starting with Aline Gatignon from Wharton. Then we'll move on to Anthea Zhang from Rice. Then Mike Peng from Dallas. Pasha Mahmood from NUS Singapore. And then Anna Grossman from Loughborough. Each of them will talk for 12 minutes maximum. Hopefully we'll, that will allow a minute perhaps for a quick question and a quick response. And there will be some time, hopefully, at the end for a little bit of Q&A to the whole panel. However, the beauty of Zoom, if there is one, is that we have the chat function. Please do use the chat function. I've encouraged the panelists to keep an eye on the chat. And um, please just put questions, recommend readings, make observations through the chat function. And the panelists will... I think, try and respond. Of course, they've got their eye on two things at once, so they may not be immediate. But let's use the chat function as much as we can, because that makes it much more interactive. There will be chance for Q&A, um, but uh, the chat function is a, is a great way of doing things. I think I should stop here and hand over to our first speaker, Aline, who's going to, as it were, set the scene, I think. Thank Aline, you so much, you're... Richard. And thank you so much uh, to the STR division and Louisa. This is a really great opportunity to, um, you know, learn more about this topic, what other people are working on, and get some feedback. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about this convergence of kind of three actors within research and non-market strategy, the firm on the one hand, the state on the other, and civil society. And I'm going to interrogate whether kind of the space in the middle there has traditionally represented a bit of a Bermuda Triangle within non-market strategy, where um, maybe some interesting questions have uh, gotten sucked away. But I think there's a real resurgence of opportunity and interest there. And um, I want to kind of steer your attention towards one specific area of that with an example from my own work. Um, so if we think about evolution of non-market strategy, there's heavily been um, you know, a, a, an emphasis on the relationship between the firm and the state, which makes a lot of sense. As per Richard's introduction, you know, the state is kind of all present um, and, and very influential. And so this literature has often considered you know, the influence of the state on firms and how firms can navigate that uh, potentially uh, to their benefit. On the other hand, we have this other set of actors civil society, um, you know, think of them as nonprofits, NGOs, uh, community-based organizations, et cetera, 
And what's really distinctive about them is that they are separate from the state and the market. And this is this is their defining characteristic, right? There really are kind of the third sector. Um, over the past few decades, though, there's kind of another stream of non-market strategy that has really started looking at the collaborative interactions between the firm and civil society under the form of typically corporate social responsibility. And we've seen increasing research interest in this area uh, commensurate with, I think, increasing practice um, of corporate social responsibility. And so even as these two areas have flourished, you can see that the triangle is kind of incomplete. And we've traditionally had, I think, these two literatures often um, in different conversations. Uh, and what I've been really excited to see lately has been this um, emergence of a lot of fantastic research that's actually kind of connecting the dots across the three. And I think giving us a much more, a much fuller and richer panorama of the interactions between these three actors and what non-market strategy uh, should reflect here. And so here's a, just a couple of examples um, illustrative, it's by no means exhausted, but these are papers that I've just tremendously enjoyed reading and that I think give us um, a lot of nuance in the way we think about the relationships between these three. What I will say though, is that I think they've often take the, taken the perspective that relationships between the firm and civil society um, are either being influenced by the state, and we, we're seeing that increasingly with, you know, um, state mandates for disclosure of social responsibility or even to do social responsibility, or that perhaps the firm is actually using uh, its interactions with civil society to somehow gain influence and goodwill from the state. Uh, and so we're really often kind of focused on what are the benefits to the firm um, with potentially some implication that it's not obvious what the uh, societal outcome uh, might be. This is really important research, I think, as academics. It's our role to be able to help society and actors better understand where people are maybe not necessarily walking the talk and saying what they're doing, um, and to understand both uh, you know, kind of both sides um, of, of non-market strategies, both what the firm might be doing that is maybe not such a win-win, and other places where there's a lot more potential for value co-creation. And that's where I want to kind of steer our attention today. Um, and I'm going to give you an example from my own work. So the idea being, you know, how can these three actors working together um, rather than influencing each other, perhaps indirectly, how can they co-create value for each of these actors in society as a whole? Uh, the example I want to give, this is from joint work with Julia Clément, Leo Bangelupe, and Luc Van Wassenhoff. And we study uh, an organization called the, no the North Star Alliance. It's a nonprofit organization. And really its role is to help address the lack of healthcare access for marginalized populations across Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular long distance truck drivers and sex workers who are kind of um, uh, excluded de facto from traditional healthcare systems. They're often mobile, uh, located far away from traditional health clinics. They have different uh, schedules from traditional health clinic schedules. Um, there's also issues of stigma associated both with HIV and AIDS and uh, sex work. Uh, so for a lot of different reasons, they're really not getting access to the healthcare they need, but also they are potentially contributing to the spread of the disease as they move along these transport corridors that span uh, multiple countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. And so, as you see, because they're spanning multiple countries, there are multiple governments that are involved and really they're falling, these populations are falling outside of the net of what those governments are providing. Um, and so it's important here to note that these clinics that they establish, uh, North Star establishes in transportation containers by the side of the highways in what are called hot spots, where places where sex workers and truck drivers uh, you know, spend a lot of time maybe because there's a border crossing ahead and they have long wait times. Um, and these are places where they can get them access to health and they can bring uh, healthcare to these populations in a way that's adapted uh, to their needs. So we have this network of clinics uh, across these transportation corridors and clinic managers who are interacting with each other to provide consistency in and quality and how they're providing care. Um, but also really looking to be embedded in their local settings. And so each clinic manager 
what they're attempting to do locally is to be kind of a piece of the puzzle. Um, so the missing piece of the puzzle in existing healthcare systems, uh, not to replace um, anything that's currently existing, but kind of to add to that, uh, to, to, to bring care to uh, populations that are not benefiting from traditional systems. And so what these local managers are gonna do, they have the autonomy um, to create their own combination of cross-sector partners on a local level, which might be uh, from the for-profit or non-profit or government uh, sectors. And so for instance, one clinic could partner with um, uh, local bars or restaurants. Um, they could partner with uh, companies that use um, truck drivers for transportation. They could also, on the other hand, work be working with nonprofit organizations, whether it's kind of uh, NGOs who uh, do development work or healthcare work, or also community-based organizations like the local dance troupe who's gonna do outreach for them. But a really important piece very often of these partnerships are government organizations, whether it's institutions such as the Ministry of Health or the government health clinics that are already set up and that uh, provide traditional forms of healthcare to the population as a whole. To give you an example from one of our interviews um, with uh, North Star representatives and clinic managers of how important they can be in partnership, um, they say, you know, if you spoke to the government nurse or the clinical officer from the government facility, you would have thought they worked for North Star because they knew so much about North Star and they would communicate so freely about what North Star does. And you can see that they're really kind of operating um, jointly. And so these partnerships are really key. The data collection here um, really spanned a couple of different stages. And our objective was really to understand what's kind of the optimal combination of the internal communications that these clinic managers have among themselves and with their regional headquarters and global headquarters mm -hmm and the stakeholders locally that they decide to, um, to work with and partner with uh, on the external side. And so there was quite a bit of qualitative work um, and the main kind of uh, bulk of the paper is based on uh, QCA analysis. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of kind of the, of the main insights from, um, uh, from, from the paper, the findings, and it's really gonna be just a snapshot, uh, but I'm happy to follow up offline. What we find is that there's a key distinction between the choice of more homogeneous versus more heterogeneous partners and fewer partners or many partners at the local level. And essentially, when you're bringing in um, more homogeneous partners, you're going to focus on the nonprofit and government sector. Uh, they have kind of clear reporting guidelines, uh, needs. Um, they might bring tangible resources to you, such as in kind of a potluck model. And then your regional um, headquarters can actually help you with some of the administration of that in a fairly efficient way. As you bring in more heterogeneous partners, however, then you're gonna have to spend a lot of time kind of being multilingual and talking across sectors and across different kind of ways of organizing. And that's gonna take a lot of your focus. Um, and it doesn't really necessarily, it's very locally embedded, doesn't necessarily um, require you to coordinate very much internally. However, if you want to kind of get a combination of the two, so very heterogeneous, but a larger set of, uh, of partners together, uh, where you could really kind of start building some scale, then you're going to need both to spend a lot of time on these relationships, but also to have a lot of support, in particular at the regional level, where you're going to have people who are really going to kind of help guide your partnerships. Um, I'm going to flip just an example from this last uh, kind of uh, this last configuration where the leadership of Northstar try to give these local coordinators autonomy to manage these uh, set partnerships, but also to give them techniques for saying, say, don't commit yourself to this. When you enter a conversation, be conscious that you can't go beyond this line. If you'll feel pressured to do that and you're in a tight situation, we've tried to build up these escalation measures so they can always kick it up the management line. And then we can bring in somebody who doesn't have that local pressure and that's really effective. So here you can really see these synergies between the external relationships you choose to engage in and the nature of your internal interactions. And that's really what we're, we're kind of uh, trying to bring out here. And so, you know, if you want to work with the with the government on these value co-creation strategies, these are three different paths through which you can do it, and they're going to require a different kind of uh, internal organization. Um, so, just to conclude, in terms of kind of our topic for the day, 
I think this is, there are huge opportunities within non-market strategy that really bring together the three actors in this triangle. Uh, and I think some, some really important directions to start probing is, you know, when and how does these kinds of collaboration happen? Um, can we consider kind of the role of direct kind of partnership ties versus more indirect ties where uh, we're gaining access through a, a third party? Um, how can we think about different governance mechanisms for getting stakeholder synergies, but also kind of offsetting the coordination costs of working with these very different partners and organizations? And then thinking really hard about who is actually benefiting. Um, are we thinking about kind of influencerance versus value co-creation? In what ways are each of these actors, um, you know, uh, getting something out of uh, of these um, of these interactions? And what does it mean for society? I think are are really key areas where strategy research can um, can you know bring a lot to the table. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to share some of this work, and I look forward to exchanging with everyone. Uh, on the chat and in Q&A. Thank you very much, Jolene. You did a really good job in both introducing uh, uh, the topic, especially with the triangle of state, civil society and firm, but also a great job in keeping to time. So if anybody has a particular question to ask um, of Aline, please do. I think we can deal with one uh, on the Q&A. If, if you raise a a virtual yellow hand, that would be probably the most effective way of drawing your attention. Does anyone want to raise a yellow or whatever hand you want, a, a, a digital hand? No, you're all too shy. Ah, oh, right. Is it Ona? Hi, yes, it's Ona. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. I will be the first one uh, to break the ice. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Really interesting work. work. Um, and I'm, I was just wondering when you were talking about um, the differences between partner types, so firm, and I put it in the chat as well, uh, firm, government, uh, civil society, is there no differences within these categories? So I can imagine, for example, that government offices are very different and have different interests and values as well compared to this topic. Um, and also different firms from different industries or civil societies active on different micro issues. Um, yeah, can you explain a bit more about that? Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's a great question. Thanks, Sona. Um, so I think I think there are kind of two parts to the answer. One is that there's for sure a lot of heterogeneity within each of the sectors. And definitely in this context, you'll see, for instance, um, you know, how do we work with a, uh, you know, a logistics company that employs uh, truck drivers across, uh, you know, multiple uh -huh. companies versus your, um, you know, versus your local bar where you have sex workers and truck drivers congregate, right? And same thing, as you said, you know, between government ministries versus local government health clinics, et cetera. Um, and nonprofits, of course, you know, there's there's a lot of diversity there. That said, I think um, what prior research has shown is that each of these sectors has kind of a, a, a different way of, uh, and I'll put your attention to Lita Nardi and Sinzi Durabantu and Vijas Hennis's uh, recent uh, paper, where they actually show that, you know, organizations for stakeholders from these different sectors require different ways of communicating with them. Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot of work kind of showing that the, I guess the, the vocabulary, the language, the interests, the, um, you know, there was another question on the dependent variable, right? The, the objectives of each of these sectors are going to differ. So I would say, yes, there's going to be, you know, more involved as the diversity within as well as across sectors increases. Um, at the same time, I think the difference across sectors increases more the complexity than that within sectors. Fabulous. Thank you, Aline. Um, perhaps you could put the Dorabantu reference in the chat. Um, but thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Anna, for breaking the ice. That's wonderful of you. Thank you. We'd better get on with Anthea next, please, if, if that's all right. OK. Can you see my slide? Great. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Louise. For inviting me. It's truly my pleasure, my honor to join this esteemed panel. So today I'm going to share a working paper with my co-author Yu Li from University of International Business and Economics. 
So my paper is about the foreign direct investment location choice, and more specifically, you know, how firms decide which foreign countries to, uh, to invest. You know, so in the international business literature, we, it's well known that for international expansion, there's huge uncertainty, right? You just don't know, you know, which country, which country market offers the best opportunity, which country market has like high risk and how to deal with, right? Especially from the perspective of emerging market companies, because for many of them, it's very different from multinational companies from Europe, from the US, they have, you know, a hundred years experience. They, they, have, they can draw from their own experience. But for many emerging market multinational companies, you know, this probably is the, the, their first few time to invest abroad. They don't have experience. So the question is that, you know, how do they decide locations for their foreign direct investment? Well, when you don't know what to do, a logical choice is just look around to see what others are doing and learn and imitate it from others. So the literature has highlighted the importance of inter-firm imitation in foreign direct investment looking choices. For example, prior study has, have found that you know, firms imitate similar firms, firms from the, in the same industry, firms from the same business group, et cetera, and firm with similar size or firm with better performance. Just look at how rosy either peer firms or leading firms are doing and imitated their, their actions. So in this study, we bring in the state ownership, right? We look at how the state ownership may affect inter-firm imitation in foreign direct investment locations. Basically, you know, in a very simple way, we divide firms into two type groups. One is like state-owned firms and non-state-owned firms. Our basic question is that, you know, who likely imitate whom? Very simple question. But let me draw you to the background of this study, right? This chart shows that, you know, Chinese companies outbound foreign direct investment in, in the past 10 years. One trend, you can see that, you know, overall is it, it declined till like 2022, mm -hmm. probably it will update it with last year data, probably kept the decline. And also, Comparing the two color bars, right? The, the light green one indicating the merge acquisition value continued con continue decline since like 2019. So this one shows Chinese companies foreign direct investment in the United States. Well, you probably will not be surprised. It peaked in 2016 and after that it dramatically declined. This shows Chinese companies foreign direct investment in Europe. Similar pattern, but less dramatic compared to in the prior one about the US. And, and I want to draw your attention to this one. It's again about the Chinese companies foreign direct investment in Europe. It separates SOE's investment from non-SOE investment. So the yellow bar are for non-SOE, the red bars are for the foreign direct investment by SOE. From this chart, you can tell that, you know, actually state-owned company have been very active in foreign direct investment. Remember, this is in Europe. Just imagine in Africa, in countries along like One Belt, One Road Initiative, the state-owned company are probably are even more active. So this is the news back to 2008. That was kind of at the beginning of the civil, civil war of Sudan. So according to this news, that China's special envoy, you know, would make his fourth, not a first, but his fourth visit to Sudan. Overall, although the overall goal is to, you know, contribute the peace, stability, and development and therefore reason. But it, you know, if you read more broadly about that time period, CNPC, you know, China's oil and gas giant, actually had a big oil field in the southern part of Sudan. So you can see that, you know, that the governments from China and China went to Sudan not only just for the overall goal of uh, keeping peace, the ability of development, but also to offer political protection for big oil projects that was made by a big state-owned company. The question is that, you know, 
when the you know government sent their envoy to Sudan, well, yes, state-owned companies buy Chinese uh, companies certainly can benefit from that. Now, how about non-state-owned companies from China? Would they benefit from the you know probably yes? So next comes to our overall brand, right? We call it as a pyramid of influence and protection. At the top of the pyramid is a state. The state has its strategic goal. They offer resources, you know, and direct as a strategic mission to state-owned companies. But when state enterprises face challenges in overseas market, the state also offers political protection to the SOE overseas uh, Then such political protection can be spilled over and over and also benefit from non-state-owned enterprise investment in the same rate. So if you think about from the non-SOE's perspective, you know that you are vulnerable and uh, you know you are going to somewhere, right? Where are you going to choose locations? You probably want to look around to see where the, where the big state-owned enterprise invest in. So that's why we, we come up with our general uh, framework say that, you know, if basically if a host country is politically more risky, then the imitation becomes more senior, right? So if in a, in a country that already has a large number of investments made by Chinese companies, then a new investor is more likely to invest in that host country, especially when the host country's political risk is high, to highlight you know, the important role of political risk. And then goes to the question, SOE versus non-SOE. Our basic argument is that, you know, now SOEs are more likely to imitators because they, they are in a more vulnerable position, right? They are more likely to be profit seeking, but they know they are vulnerable, they seek protection. That's why when now SOE make a new investment overseas, they are more sensitive than SOE just to look around in the host country and say, hey, you know, who, who else from China have already invested in, in that country that you take that as information cue. And our second prediction is that, you know, compared to now SOE, SOEs are more likely to be imitated. Because remember, like if when SOE, they are faced challenge, they are in troubles, their home country government is more likely to send help overseas. So, and brief background about the research context, we look at, you know, Chinese companies outbound investment in the period of 2001 to 2013. Reason is that, you know, before 2000, China's outbound FDI was really relatively sparse. And also the One Belt, One Road initiative announced in 2013. So after that, probably investment logic might be very different. So we look at the gap window between 2001 and 2013. I'm not gonna bore you with all the measurements, I'm just go directly with you know the, the results. So overall, we found that yes, you know the number of Chinese investor company in a host country has a consistent and a positive relationship on the likelihood that a new investment is going to be made in that country. And also to show that you know the political risk level of the host country play a positive moderating effect. To show here, if you can see. The, 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 the yellow bar means that a host country with high level political risk, then the imitation effects is much stronger than the green bar means that when the political risk is much lower. Similarly, we also found that, you know, if the new investor is SOE, is not SOE, which is the green bar, then the imitation effect is much stronger than the, you know, the, the yellow bar when the new investor is, is, the, is the not SOE. So we, then we separate, right, uh, the existing investment into by, by non-SOE and, and SOE. If we put them separately in different models, you will say, oh, both are matters. But when we put the existing investment by SOE, non-SOE in the same model, which is model four, you can see that, you know, the number of SOE investment has very stable, consistent effect, but impact of existing non-SOE investment is significantly reduced. So in this table summarized, basically you said that if the new investor is SOE, they really don't care about how many investment 
made by non-SOE in the country. They may look at investment by not other SOE, but not non-SOE. But if your new investor is a non-SOE, they still pay much more attention to the SOE than attention to non-SOE. So, okay, I stop here. Just in case, you know, we have some questions. Thank you very much, Anthea. Um, Thank you, Richard. There's a, a, that's fabulous. And coming from a country where there are going to be more state-owned enterprises in the near future, um, <clears throat> that's quite fascinating. Um, there have been one or two questions, one quite a tough one from Louise, I think, in the chat. Mm -hmm. I suggest that we we deal with the, the questions via the chat. There's also okay. I see some quite interesting correspondence between Stephanie and Aline. So there's plenty going on in the chat. Keep them going. I'm going to mispronounce your name. I'm, I'm sorry, Ching. Ching. I'm oh, sorry. Um, perhaps you could put the question in the chat to Anthea. And then, of course, everybody will have a chance to um, respond and, and join in that way. Thank you very much, Anthea. That's wonderful. And I saw some rounds of applause. I would join that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we should go on with Mike, if that's possible. Sounds good, Richard. Thank you for inviting me. Let's uh, go ahead to share my screen. Okay, are we seeing my slide? Okay. All right, wonderful. Good morning, good afternoon, good day. Uh, thanks for, so much for coming here. Uh, I would argue today is really a day of festivities. Uh, we're coming, uh, uh, a, a day of festivities. We're coming here to celebrate the emerging and emergence of uh, research agenda, increasingly focusing on the state. There are lots of ways to slice and dice this beast. Uh, um, I want to present this uh, short paper on corporate diplomacy and exit strategies, uh, collaborating with Jane Lee and Danny Shapiro from uh, Simon Fraser University. Um, the word diplomacy has been widely known and widely noted, and the art of diplomacy has been practiced by um, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, if um, for, you know, as a chat function, if I could recommend one single book on diplomacy, that's Henry Kissinger's book. Uh, I fell in love with it when it came out in 1994. And I'm, I'm still periodically rereading that book. Highly recommend it. Uh, but you know what? Traditional practice of um, um, diplomacy, and there's also quite a bit of research on diplomacy, they never bother to note that it is at the country level. Specifically, it's about country level diplomacy. Well, talking about our firm level work, right? Uh, we deal with multinational enterprises, MNEs. And all textbooks traditionally assume that. MNEs from a single country are supposed to be supporting and importantly be supported by their home country diplomacy. Their home country government is right behind them. So all they need to do is the third bullet point, that is they go around entering different countries. So they obviously need to focus on how to deal with host country governments and also host country stakeholder groups. Um, but we now live in an increasingly complicated era. Uh, during this uh, era, um, some of these assumptions have to be revisited, sometimes have been refuted. That is, m and &E interests and activities may not necessarily be supported by their own home country government. For example, numerous Western m and &E spent decades of their time and energy building up a large market in Russia since the early 1990s. And all of a sudden, 2022 happened, the invasion happened, their home country governments um, demanded, coerced them to withdraw from Russia. Well, what do you do as corporate executives, right? So that becomes a hot question, a relevant question, a timely question, but also I would argue an under-researched question. We as a field just have not done that much research, but practitioners have to make decisions right away on the spot as bullets are, are, are being fired and people are being killed. So how can m and pursue the interests that sometimes diverge from those of their home country government? And that is a, a challenging question. I don't think we have a good answer. And we are here uh, providing 
taking some initial steps. There are many answers, but one answer I would argue is to use corporate diplomacy, specifically um, uh, using our jargon and many non-market political and social strategies that both respond to and shape country-level um, diplomacy. Jean Lee, Danny, and another colleague of ours um, two years ago published one paper on corporate diplomacy in the age of US-China rivalry. And um, so this is the first time uh, we are presenting the second piece out of that stream of work. In fact, today is the first time and I have presentations scheduled um, after this particular event. Um, I would take advantage of a, a, an opening case of my own teaching on day one. This is also um, the opening case of my own textbook, Global Business, fifth edition. And that is a hard case about Apple, China, and America. And take a look at this Apple CEO in the middle. He is engaging in what we call corporate diplomacy in two countries, all right? And uh, it, there is some likelihood that we are going to see President Trump term two. Then this cartoon will become very relevant again. So um, in terms of corporate diplomacy, we are not only talking about Trump, uh, Apple dealing with the Chinese president and the Chinese government in a host country says. Apple also has to deal with the US government. In fact, you know, the cartoon can only capture one president, but ever since uh, President George W. Bush, every US president raised this question um, in front of Apple's uh, CEO. Why couldn't Apple make the iPhone in the United States? It's a very difficult no to say to your president. You gotta be very diplomatic. Um, so long story short, I, I'm not gonna be, um, you know, burdening with a lot of details. But long story short, Apple has been able to play ball in both countries. I mean, play ball, to keep itself in the game, okay, instead of dropping the ball. And uh, when the US and China relationship was relatively good, it was already very extraordinary to uh, be able to deliver that much value as Apple did, according to the resource space view. You know, you got to have some very valuable, rare, and hard to imitate capabilities. And uh, as NCS presentation mentioned, since 2016, the relationship has become uh, you know, worse and worse. And during that time, Apple was not only able to play ball, but also able to become the first $1 trillion market capitalization company. That is something. That is about some extraordinary corporate diplomacy. And um, now corporate diplomacy is becoming more important. And this is something I've been teaching my students to do. We want to say this. We want to teach our students who will be executives. The first bullet point as a direct quote, can we still be friends while I'm withdrawing from your country? It's very difficult to say. Uh, professors, most of your professors, we have some PhD students. Can we say that? Can we still be friends while I'm withdrawing from your country? And this is exactly what Tim Cook did. Take a look at what he did in March of 2023, because of COVID, he did not visit China um, for the last four years, and he went to participate in a development uh, forum, shaking hands with various Chinese uh, government officials and other stakeholders, and he continues to do this. Uh, and make no mistake, he went to China to plan and organize some of the exit actions or exit strategies, if you will, okay? So um, it, it is not completely withdrawing, but it's slowly exiting. And this is a, um, a more recent picture taken about uh, six months ago in October, 2023, when he was shaking hands with the Chinese Minister of Commerce. Um, and, and, and again, this is just some very difficult uh, moves to make, but as MNEs, and I believe we as researchers of MNE strategies, we will have to deal with some of these uncomfortable actions, decisions, implementation schemes. Um, so um, that leads to the new research agenda, right? Most IV and strategy textbooks, including my own, have a great chapter on market entries, which rightly so, because it is supported by a huge research literature. Vast majority of our literature deals with market entries. None has a chapter on market exit strategies, so this becomes a hot new research area as I am embarking on the revision for the sixth edition of my global business. You know what? Uh, we are going to have a new chapter about international market entries and exits. So 
how can MNEs leverage corporate diplomacy to manage exit strategies? And one more time, diplomacy doesn't mean only dealing with host country governments and stakeholders who sometimes can be challenging. You know what, you can be Apple and your own home country government may give you trouble. Exhibit A is the recent lawsuit launched by the US government against Apple for alleged monopoly. That means Apple needs to do more on corporate diplomacy dealing with its own home country government in addition to dealing with uh, host country governments. Um, and you know what, why we haven't done much research on exits? Number one, companies, uh, it's not that companies are not doing a lot of exits. Companies have been doing a lot of exits, but under the radar, but generally speaking, it's more exciting to go in. Uh, it's easier to conduct corporate diplomacy when you are bringing in capital, technology, generating jobs, proposing to make, pay more taxes, right? It's actually a lot more challenging if you're telling the host country governments and stakeholders you are getting out. But please, can we still be friends? Can we please uh, still be friends? And that is a very delicate, challenging, but necessary skill and capability um, that these companies will need to have. So uh, the, the heart of the new paper is to um, suggest this very simple um, two by two. So the decision is exit or no exit, go or no go. Now it's exit, no exit, right? And sometimes um, we're not only exiting the host countries, we are also exiting possibly some of the original home countries. And we are talking about moving global headquarters out of your original head, uh, home country, such as when HSBC did um, moving from Hong Kong in the early 1990s. So that is opening up a, a lot of interesting moves. Um, I'll quickly go through these case studies. Uh, McDonald's is a, a good example talking about one of uh, hundreds of m &Es getting out of Russia. And the first McDonald's opened uh, in the Soviet Union in 1990. I don't know if you could see, but take a look at where my cursor is. That is a flag of the Soviet Union before 1991. There was uh, the time when the Soviet Union was still around and it took McDonald's 14 years before 1990 to reach that step, all right? So the amount of um, challenges, uh, you know, it was too much to recount now. But quickly, fast forward to 2022, uh, now McDonald's is no longer operating. This is a picture of the first opening of this one called Riksuno e Tochkau. In English, it means tasty and that's it. Uh, so McDonald's sold its business to a Russian group populated by current or ex McDonald's Russian executive team. And very interestingly, you can see how reluctant McDonald's was. It has a 15 year option to buy back its former restaurants. So in the next 15 years, McDonald's is uh, hoping for peace. And I think all of us uh, need to pray for, for peace in that region and peace in the world so that McDonald's could go back to Russia if needed. Um, case study two is Pfizer. Pfizer is the one that developed some of the COVID shots uh, that a lot of us took. I personally took one. So Pfizer had faced the similar decision to get out of Russia or not. Well, it came to the decision that the Russians can go on without McDonald's, but Russians, some Russians at least, could not go on without some of the mission critical Pfizer medicines and vaccine shots. So Pfizer decided to continue to provide medicines to Russia to prevent suffering and potential loss of life, but no more new clinical trials and investments. And in this day and age of CSR, in case anyone criticizes Pfizer for being greedy, for profits only, blah, 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 Pfizer said, you know what, we're gonna be donating all the money, all the profit we made out of Russia to Ukraine relief efforts. So these decisions, direct quote from Pfizer, uh, align with our patient first values and ensure that every dollar of profit derived from Russia will strengthen Ukraine and its people, so on and so forth. So Pfizer made a, a different decision, basically. The decision um, is not uh, preordained, despite pressures from Pfizer's home country government to get out of Russia. Um, more well, I think we should really wind up about now or fairly soon. Okay, uh, let's let's just uh, talk about this moving from Hong Kong to London, uh, and then um, spend a minute on this one. Um, 
everybody heard about TikTok. TikTok is a company that's in deep trouble in the host country, the United States. Relatively few people heard about that TikTok is 100% owned by ByteDance. ByteDance is headquartered in Beijing, and ByteDance um, has debated about moving its headquarters out of China. Long story short, ByteDance said, if we moved out of uh, China, uh, the Xi government is not going to be happy. And the fact that majority of our business is in Beijing and in China will stay in China as our headquarters location. TikTok already moved its headquarters to the United States and Singapore. Um, two pictures at the bottom are visual illustrations of how to deal with host country government and stakeholders. Um, the last slide, in conclusion, um, this requires a lot of work or diplomatic work, both at the country level and the corporate level requires nurturing and managing relationships over a long period of time with understanding, patience, and goodwill. And we simply need to do more research in this aspect, especially we need to prepare our students and our executive um, um, clients and executive uh, uh, training, executive education students, practitioners, how to deal with this. We need to understand how can, man how can we manage relationships, legitimacy, and stakeholders. Ultimately, I would argue using my um, familiar term, managing institutions as rules of the game. They are institutions governing exit strategies. We just need to do a good job um, dissecting, uh, taking a deep dive into these institutions, which can become the new frontier of the institution-based review. That is the end of my presentation, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we've had a lot of questions and there are a few questions specifically to Mike um, in the chat that I hope Mike and uh, might be able to pick up. And I know the other panelists have also picked up some questions. Klaus Jacobs has tried to make sense of this all in a very, very brave contribution, which might also um, encourage people to engage with him. So please do use the chat, but I'm going to move on to, to Pasha right now. And um, I hope he'll be able to uh, introduce more perspectives for Klaus to try and make sense of. Thank you, Pasha. Hi, Richard. Uh, hi, thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, Anthea. Thanks, Aline. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about work that I'm doing with my colleague, uh, Marlene Dilleman and Ed Zajac. So this is about how do firms deal with regulators in nascent markets or new markets. Now, let me see if I can get this. Uh, I usually do empirical work, but this was a kind of extension of the cases that I have been writing for the last few years. And what I was observing was very interesting phenomena for, uh, let's say, motorcycle ride sharing firms in Indonesia or mobile payments uh, in Bangladesh. They were operating at a zone when there was no regulation, which basically they say that they couldn't do something or they said they could do something. So there was this lack of regulator, regulations that created a zone of discretion. And we saw a lot of uh, approaches to deal with that kind of discretion because there was no regulation per se for ride sharing in uh, motorcycle ride sharing or uh, online payments in uh, Bangladesh. So this is uh, some like Gojek, they completely ignored the regulator they bypassed the regulator, they didn't talk to the regulator. Then this company called Bikash in Bangladesh, they work very closely with the regulator from day one. They kind of co-created uh, the regulatory framework that Alvin was talking about. And then you had somebody who wanted to use customer legitimacy as a way to get regulatory legitimacy. Remember, if customer loves you, the government will have to love you. Now, all businesses face legal issues as part of their business operations and companies naturally would like the laws that apply to them to be favorable. But some companies enter a line of business that has a legal issue at its core, a significant uncertainty regarding how the law will apply to a main part of their business operations, a need for new regulations in order for products to be feasible or profitable, or a legal restriction that prevents the long-term operations of the business. So. This is from legal scholars. They have been spending quite a bit of time trying to understand how these new business models that are coming, how do they, how do they deal with regulators? So this is a bit different. 
So the research that we are doing, our goal is to identify some of these firm specific uh, some organization specific factors, some institutional factors that might uh, affect the optimal regulatory strategy in nascent markets. Now, it's increasingly relevant, but understudied. So for example, we heard about non-market strategy literature, and there's a lot of work in non-market strategy literature that focus on how established firms pursue regulatory strategies like lobbying literature, capture versus compliance, kind of actions, then there is also literature new market creation that focus on how firms address customer legitimacy, customer uncertainty, but that underplays the regulatory aspect of it. Now, there is relevant work on institutional strategy. If you look at and category creation, new category creation, like Shu and Grodal, or Gao and McDonald and Garud, that basically deal with the co-evolutionary process that leads to the creation of new markets. What we thought we need a more general theory on how to decide on the regulatory engagement strategy. For example, what should be the optimal strategy and how should it vary with uh, different kind of firm characteristics, institutional characteristics, organizational characteristics. That's what we wanted to do. Now, first, what do we mean by nascent markets? Now, when you are an Uber or when you are Gojek or when you are Bikash, or when you are in Tunaiku in Indonesia, you have to have two, in a way, you have two customers to deal with. One is the typical customers who decide whether to buy your product or service. You exist because somebody is willing to pay for your product or service. So you have to have customer legitimacy. And so you have to deal with this, uh, this uh, market ambiguity. But at the same time, you also have regulator. You need regulatory legitimacy, which gives you the license to play. So you have to also have the regulatory ambiguity. How, how should the regulations pan out? So you have two kinds of customers, so to speak. One is the typical customers who decides whether to buy your product or service. And then you have the regulator who decides how to deal with you. Now, in the case of, because there is no clear market yet, yet so you have high market ambiguity. If you look at between low and high, and you have low regulatory ambiguity, high regulatory ambiguity. Nascent market is when you have both high market ambiguity and high regulatory ambiguity. On the other hand, if you look at the extreme bottom left, you have low market ambiguity, market has already emerged and regulations have already been crystallized. So you have uh, low market ambiguity. So nascent market is characterized by both kinds of ambiguities. Now, the dilemma of the innovator like, or we call it market creator, is that, think about this. The challenge in the marketplace from the customer's point of view is how do you stand out? How do you make the customer look at you, accept you, and make you stand out from others? From the point of view of the regulator is how do you fit in? So you have this uh, dilemma is that you have, uh, the more you fit in, the less likely you are going to be subject to regulatory backlash. But on the other hand, the more you want to engage with the regulators, it takes time, energy, and it might actually reduce your compromise or ability to uh, fit in, uh, ability to uh, experiment with market, pivot, and all these things. So that creates the dilemma. So seeking greater leg regulatory legitimacy comes with the cost of autonomy loss associated with compliance. And the higher the regulatory engagement, the higher the level of time, attention, and resources. So let me repeat what I'm trying to say. So in the nascent market, you need two kinds of legitimacy. You need market legitimacy, which is typical with the customer legitimacy, and then you need regulatory legitimacy. You need customer engagement to get the customer legitimacy. You need regulatory engagement to get the reg regulatory legitimacy. The problem is, the more you try to do the regulatory legitimacy by engaging with the regulator, the less time and energy and resources you have to deal with customers. And sometimes the regulator will actually tell you, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do. So there is a trade-off here. And uh, our research question is to explore how does the nature of trade-off depend, uh, how does it vary depending on, for example, what is your business model? What kind of industry you come from? What are the characteristics of the investor? 
what kind of institutional context the firm finds itself. For example, if you are your business model depends on platform, on demand externality. It's very important for you to get as much customer, as many customers as quickly as possible. So you probably don't want to waste time. Probably you want to have, you care a lot about the uh, speed. So the cost of dealing with a uh, regulator is higher for you. As opposed to if you look at the, some other kind of investors for them like a family or uh, reputation is very important the stigma that comes from being delegitimized might be more important. So depending on the relative importance you put on customer uh, versus the regulator, so your optimal engagement strategy would vary. So look at this case. Think about social benefit and social risk. You have low social benefit, high social risk, or low social risk, high social risk. And depending on what kind of business model you have, regulator would give you different sorts of restrictions. So for example, if you're Khan Academy, you don't expect the regulator to come and shut you down. So what it means is that your marginal cost is likely to be flatter. So you would be, uh, so you can continue to engage with the regulator without having to give up much of autonomy. On the other hand, if you're doing something which is FinTech, which is a little bit more complicated because it could be socially inclusive, but at the same time, it could have negative spillover effect. So this is just an example. So we go on several of these uh, things. So very quickly, two other points. Although this uh, research basically builds on this idea that there is a trade-off, but we understand that sometimes you don't have a trade-off. You actually have a case when you need the regulatory legitimacy to gain the customer legitimacy. So it's not that if you actually when you're having more regulatory legitimacy, you're going to have less. Sometimes you actually need the regulatory legitimacy to get the customer legitimacy. So we think about that kind of things. And also, we talk about the substitutive uh, mechanism, which is when actually, instead of engaging with the regulator directly, what you do is you actually engage with customers. And because you engage the customers, the regulator needs legitimacy too. Because the customers love you, regulators are more likely to be nice to you. So this is an alternative. So in the first uh, speaker, I think Aline was talking about the link between state and the uh, firm and the, uh, the civic society. So it is like this, instead of dealing directly with the state, you deal with the civic society and have the civic society put pressure on the regulator, the state. This is one way of doing so. If that's the case, actually the marginal benefit is likely to be less because somebody else is doing it for you. So you don't need to engage. Now, second thing, which I we don't have time here to do it, is you see the restriction is not exogenous. Whether regulator want to have more or less restriction also depends on how you as a firm have been dealing with the regulator. So there is a dynamic interaction there. So what we are trying to do is to bring that kind of dynamic interaction to explain where you can have path dependency. For example, because you engage with the regulator first time, regulator gives invites you to join the sandbox. Because you join the sandbox and you share the regulatory experiments, you are asked to be a co-creator. Not everybody can actually do these things. So there is some kind of a dynamic interaction there. So uh, that's that's what uh, we have been trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pasha. That's very interesting. Um, certainly in the UK, there's an awful lot of uh, regulatory issues um, with, our, with our basic utilities. So I think the regulatory even old established industries have very um, very uncertain regulatory environments. So I think your your issues are very relevant. Now, there's been some good chat, and I do draw everyone's attention to that. And maybe uh, people will put questions to Pasha. Thank you, Aline, Anthea, Mike, um, for contributing to the chat. And Anna has also mentioned her forthcoming Journal of Management Studies special issue, which I think is a good uh, launch pad for her own and last presentation. Aline, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry? So uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard and Luis, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar symposium. I'm really delighted to be part of such a distinguished uh, panel. My research uh, 
is uh, uh, almost entirely related to the role of state in the economy. So I'm really delighted to be part of that uh, panel. And uh, I would like to uh, launch straight into the special issue that uh, we are writing with the Journal of Management Studies on, on that uh, field. Uh, so the role of state and uh, how the firms respond with their strategies to this increasing involvement of, of state in the economy. So anything on ownership, institutions and beyond, including corporate political ties, um, corporate diplomacy, uh, interactions between uh, home and host governments in the context of internationalization. So we're looking at all kinds of submissions and we're trying to uh, shape this around this new uh, construct uh, which we call state capitalism uh, which is an ambiguous concept but essentially it is uh, a system where the state is becoming an economic actor Actor. So, um, for example, as an owner of economic entities such as state-owned enterprises and sovereign wealth funds and beyond ownership, it's also uh, the way for the state to use various tools for proactive intervention in economic uh, uh, functioning of, of the countries, the home countries or, or the host countries. So, um, the management scholarship has begun rethinking the role of the state and uh, um, what we're trying to do with the special issue, we're trying to encourage scholars to come up with new theoretical perspectives on the role of state because the theories that have been developed around the role of state are a little bit dated. So either they have been developed uh, during the earlier phases of uh, the role of state, which primarily were manifesting through privatization or they were based as management theories on advanced economies. So we're looking at refreshing this theoretical umbrella uh, that will bring uh, our scholarship in line with what is happening now, with what we see around the world, with the different types of intervention tools that uh, the states are using to um, impact the economies, to impact the firm strategies. So uh, anything um, you know that uh, you would think of that would contribute to the development of management theories, and we have seen in the past the use of resource dependence theory because this is uh, something that the firms are doing when they are looking to you know attract uh, the state resources and and kind of the mutual uh, embeddedness between the firms and the state resource based view use using the connections to the governments as a sustainable advantage agency theory. We're looking at, uh, uh, looking at agency theory from a fresh perspective and uh, uh, developing, of course, um, institutional theory that has seen uh, a prominent uh, intake in the last 10 years through primarily um, international business studies that look at states in a comparative perspective. And then other series that you might want to bring if you are an interdisciplinary scholar from political science or sociology of development into the management literature. So we, we are encouraging um, different theoretical contributions to this special issue and also a, a broad array of methodological contributions from qualitative studies to uh, large scale quantitative uh, studies and studies, of course, in different contexts. And if you are interested in purely submitting um, a conceptual piece like Klaus was commenting, you know, what are the different types of uh, state involvement in the economy, how the state acts as a regulator, as an economic agent, uh, as a, um, you know, investor uh, through uh, sovereign wealth funds, as there may be a uh, um, you know, as a way of sort of influencing other other governments. Uh, we, we have a paper that I come uh, later in the Journal of International Business Studies that talk about the discrete power of states. So anything, we would be really happy to receive your contributions. So we're looking at uh, primarily uh, building out a theoretical understanding of how the, the role all of state or state capitalism impacts firms and firm strategies in various contexts. So how does state capitalism impact firms within the state orbit? So you might have research on state-owned enterprises or sovereign wealth funds, but also how does state 
capitalism impact firms operating in context with high incidences of state capitalism. So that could be firms that do not have uh, you know, direct state uh, ownership, but are national champions or are operating in uh, strategic and, and sensitive industries that might be subject to state interference. So it's a really kind of uh, broadly uh, scoped special issue. So um, let's talk about state and firm strategies. How do firms respond uh, to the increasing involvement of state in the economy. So of course, uh, it depends on various factors and we're looking to uncover this in a special issue. So the state intervention that we have seen recently has a variety of forms. It could also be, it could be through bailouts as we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic in a lot of economies, even traditionally those economies where uh, the state takes the, uh, the back role behind the market, uh, the state has increased uh, its role as an economic agent. Uh, for example, in the UK, there were a number of firms being bailed out because otherwise they would have failed. Another uh, interesting aspect of state intervention is through investments. And I will come to that in a minute. Through sovereign wealth funds, uh, some countries have managed to uh, acquire a considerable amount of assets abroad. And how does this work you know what would those uh, entities uh impose some kind of you know political goals in addition to financial goals on the companies that they own uh so these are very interesting questions that we are uh yet to be um that 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 are yet to be answered and then other ways of state intervention, perhaps more subtle through uh, subsidies or industrial policies are also interesting so um it, it would be nice to focus on particular industries um, and uh, these industries can be taken on a global scale. So we haven't seen any studies on the role of state uh, in let's say oil and gas around the world, right? Not just in a particular country, not just in China or US, but how does this play on a global scale? So looking at a particular industry but across different institutional contexts would be really relevant. And then of course, you can, uh, if, if you are a specialist in a particular context, you can dig further into an understudied political or economic context. So um, for example, uh, we, we are lacking studies in uh, countries where state has a prominent role, like Middle East or, or Africa, but that have for some reason been understudied in this kind of literature. So we're looking at uncovering these additional contexts. So why the manifestation of state in any shape or form is an important topic for us as scholars to study. And I'm taking here an example of the UK because I'm living in the UK and I, I'm fascinated by by that country that has traditionally been considered as a liberal market economy, but that has seen uh, a considerable influence of, of uh, state-owned uh, entities from abroad uh, over the years. And here I'm looking at how this uh, influence has shifted over the years because it really depends on the flavor of the months. So it depends on the changes in the political regime, on the ideology, on the leadership, so in the UK, we have seen in the early 90s uh, up to 2010 investments by uh, Russia, by Russian oil and gas. So uh, UK has also invested in Russian oil and gas uh, through the joint ventures with, with, uh, between BT and Rosneft that has now been dismantled. So this um, you know, has of course dried out during the um, uh, 2014 and ongoing during the sanctions against Russia and, and Russian oligarchs. And at the same time, you can see that the capital um, from coming from Russia has been gradually replaced um, by other um, uh, state-owned capital. So in the 2010s, China was investing heavily in the UK, but then recently, there has been also an increased disengagement from joint interests uh, with China. And we have seen this really strong government rhetoric mentioning the surveillance or cybersecurity threat 
the um, International Foreign Office investigating every single investment coming from China and essentially giving the last say on whether that investment can go through or not. So a number of investment has been turned out, turned, turned down. Um, some things have also been dismantled, like uh, stripping off the entire Huawei 5G network that has brought disruption to the UK infrastructure because you know it has not really been replaced by something else. Um, also, the government has bought out uh, China's interest from um, the uh, uh, nuclear power plant investment, which amounted to hundreds of millions of, of dollars. So why are we not investigating you know, uh, this shift right in, in the government's rhetoric and how this uh, influences firm strategies? I think this is a really important topic, but yet we have not seen any papers coming out of this. So uh, lately, you know, we have observed the replacement of capital. So in, instead of Russia or China, uh, the UK government is now suddenly very favorable to other regimes. And I don't know if one regime is better than the other. So now we have seen from 2020 uh, a, a huge uh, inflow of capital from uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds and mostly from Middle East. So the total investment from uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, is about 65 billion US dollars into the UK. It's a huge amount of money. And so we, we don't necessarily know how much is invested in the UK until we sort of um, add up all these five to 10% investments by different sovereign wealth, wealth funds. So again, this is an interesting uh, dynamic to to investigate. Does it create a threat because of you know you know maybe it's it's not a threat because they are sort of owning individually five to ten percent of each asset, but uh, combined, you know, it's a huge investment in some of the you know strategic assets in the UK in real estate in um, life sciences. Um, so this is in, in technology. So this is not negligible. So this um, kind of brings me to the next uh, um, topic where I want to talk about. Uh, Anna, we should probably make this the last slide. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So, so this is the uh, published paper. So you could you could look it up. I just want you to um, uh, sort of take away um, one idea from that from that slide. So there are different ways that the state can use state-owned entities, whether that's state-owned enterprises or sovereign funds to influence um, the economies abroad. And so in, in this Journal of International Business Studies, we propose the theoretical framework that you can test if you have the data on your own um, you know, uh, institutional context. So this uh, kind of is a two by two metrics where the state uh, go abroad with um, objectives that are either economic or social and that are either uh, sort of uh, directed to um, improve their own economies or improve the standing of their economies abroad. And so, um, yeah, uh, this is something that you could take forward and test empirically. And then the final slide to conclude is the... Uh, response of of the firms to this increased role of state so how do firm deal how do firms deal with uh this uh, um uh state intervention well they deal primarily through corporate political ties and so uh, this is another uh publication that um has been uh has been uh, uh that that I've worked on with with colleagues and so you could uh, essentially continue this work by um, by looking further into the different types of corporate political ties and how they impact firm performance and, and firm strategies and, and, and governance. And this, again, there's a number of theoretical perspectives that can be used to develop this, uh, this work. So my top three research questions, and Richard, I conclude on that slide, uh, would be around um, basically the, the internationalization. So what strategies do firms use to evade government economic activism and how they use international expansion to reduce government influence? 
And what happens if uh, government influence is reversed? So that goes back to the previous slide on corporate political ties. So when the state is captured by the firms through this corporate political ties uh, mechanism. And then finally, and that also relates to this mutual embeddedness, what is the optimal distance from the state under various forms of state capitalism? Because you can never be far away from the states as we have seen even in the UK. So thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to interacting with you more on that topic. Thank you so much, Anna. That's a, a great way of finishing because I think Fezel Altali, I think I got your name nearly right, um, raised the issue during the presentations that basically the state is getting more important. I think all five of the panelists have revealed, exposed and encouraged all sorts of issues about the state for research. Grateful to you all. What's wonderful is that Anna has this General Management Studies special issue coming out. Aline mentioned what seems to me to be a very relevant strategic management journal uh, special issue coming out or, or, or looking for papers um, on dealing with grand challenges where the state will also be important. Pina Oskan, one of my colleagues, is a co-editor of that. So I think this is a time to encourage more research and to note that there are more outlets for publication than there have been for a very long period of time. So this is a great opportunity, especially for um, new researchers to get involved in this really important but neglected area of research. One last time, let me thank all the panellists and also all those who've contributed via the chat. Thank you so much. And with that, I think I should bring it all to a close. This will be available on video on the AOM's uh, website fairly soon. It usually takes a week or two. So you'll be able to pursue things there. Okay. Thank you very much, Aline, Anthea, Mike, Pasha, Anna. Lovely to hear have you on the panel. <laughs>